Hello, hello, hello. Hey, if you're talking, be quiet. Come on, it's for Matt Hoyt. Let's, let's be like a talk, talk set would be, I guess. Uh, my name is Bryce Christensen. I was one of Matt's cousins and Matt's cousin. Um, I'm going to hand it over to the MC for the rest of the day. Uh, Superwoman, total coordinator, did the whole thing here for us. So uh, give her a round of applause first. But Melissa Bell will kind of take you through the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, folks. Um, there's a little bit more space over here towards the entrance. So if you guys want to go around, do it. Um, if you want to keep hanging back and drinking and eating, do that too. Um, I am going to tell you to shush when there's a couple important speeches. So just know that this is not one of them. Um, <laughs> I wanted to make sure you guys were paying attention. Um, I'm Melissa Bell. I'm one of the hosts for this wonderful, wacky, wild Matt Hoyt retrospective. Um, it is my honor to be here today. I'm so grateful for all of you for being here today. Um, so first and foremost, I want to just have everyone give a big round of applause for Matt Hoyt. Also Mark Waite, too. Don't want to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I have the privilege of being Matt Hoyt's sister-in-law, um, though over the last 15 years, I've kind of dropped the in-law um, because Matt became my older brother. Um, it did not start out that way. I will say that when I first met Matt, I was very suspicious of this crazy, crazy individual who wanted to date my sister. <laughs> Um, and it turned out that Matt, in his way, persisted, despite all of, my, all of the obstacles I threw in his way. And it also turned out that Matt Hoyt was right. Uh, he was a great partner to my sister. And we were lucky enough as a family to welcome a son, a brother, and most importantly to me, one of my best friends. Um, and so, we're going to celebrate the hell out of Matt Hoyt today. We're going to have some speeches, we're going to have some music, we're going to have some memories, we're going to have a lot of laughter, we're probably going to have a few tears, um, but it's going to be a hell of a party. Um, and I wanted to do a couple quick introductions because um, Matt was nothing short of the best connector I've ever met in my entire life. Um, he created this community. Uh, he kept us together um, with his verve and his energy and his passion. And uh, I want us to keep that spirit alive and connect with each other today. So this is a really big crowd of people, but I'm going to try to introduce you guys to each other really fast. Okay? Um, I can't do it individually, so I apologize. But I'm going to ask you guys a couple of questions just so you can sort of get a sense of who everyone is in this crowd. Okay? So... Please raise your hand if you are part of the Hoyt clan. Hoyt clan, raise your hand. All right. If you're part of the McKellogg clan, raise your hand. Okay. Raise your hand if you ever went to a turkey mallet show. Raise your hand if you knew Matt in San Francisco. All right. Raise your hand if you ever worked at Starlight. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have ever eaten at Starlight. If you did not just raise your hand, you all have to make a reservation for next weekend. <laughs> Who here has eaten something crazy because Matt insisted on, doing, on eating something crazy? All right. Who has done some crazy music project or art project or video project because Matt insisted on it? Yeah. All right. Who here has heard the shrimp drawer story? Okay. If you haven't, ask somebody who has so they can tell it to you. Who has heard the poopy chaps story? 
Who has heard about the time that Matt was kidnapped by a Dan Aykroyd lookalike? <laughs> Who in this crowd stole a limo with Matt Hoyt? <laughs> Way in the back. We see you. All right. Who here fucking loved the hell out of Matt Hoyt? All right, thank you for participating in that and I apologize to my parents for my profanity. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, we have a great program ahead. Uh, we've got some wonderful people speaking. First and foremost though is my beautiful, my wonderful, my amazing sister, Allison Bell Hoyt. <laughs> Hello. Well, thank you, Melissa. You've always been a hard act to follow. <laughs> Love you, Allison. Woo! <clears throat> they say you can tell where a beautiful soul has been by the love they leave behind. Well, it is evident today that Matt's enormous soul left, left a lot of love in this world. If you don't know me by now, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Allison Hoyt, and I am Matt Hoyt's wife. I want to start off today by thanking this incredible community. Thank you to my friends and family who have stepped up and done so much for me. Thank you to all of you who have surrounded me with love and light during this dark time. The story of Matt and I began 16 years ago. My dear friend Danielle Rhodes dragged me out to a party called Prom at the Imperial House in Bankers Hill. <clears throat> it was a fundraiser and a wild December party, so it was definitely a dressy affair. I wore a sparkly vintage dress, and while most of the party showed up already coupled off, Danielle and I went stag. Meanwhile, Matt showed up with his wingman, the one and only Dimitri. <clears throat> It was, a, it was weird that we had never met before that night. Matt was 30 and I was 29. We had grown up only a few miles apart in East County. I went to Grossmont High School and he went to Valhalla. We both graduated the same year. We both floated in the same art and music scenes in San Diego. We even figured out that our exes had once dated each other, <laughs> which was only slightly odd to us considering how small San Diego can be. From the moment I met Matt, I knew he sparkled differently than the rest of the world. He was a ball of nonstop energy. We spent most of the night dancing, laughing, and storytelling. We chatted about all sorts of things. <clears throat> he was by far the most talkative man I have ever come across. <laughs> right from that first night, he made me feel so safe to talk about anything. I told him all sorts of things, big and small. We discussed everything from our, share views, from our shared views on politics to my insecurities. I even told him that I think I may have painted my kitchen too bright of an orange color. <laughs> it may sound like a trivial detail now, but that's how safety made me feel. Like I could just reveal all the things going on inside me right away. Even though we had just met, he felt like family from the start. At the end of the night, he asked me for my number. He didn't write it down, he memorized it. <laughs> I, I, I thought he, he's blowing me off. But then, an hour after I got home, he called me. And he asked me if he could come see the color of my kitchen. <laughs> uh, and I really did want his opinion on the orange color. So that's how he got his foot in the door. <laughs> will, you hold, will you hold this? Yes. Yeah. I'm shaking. Um, uh, sorry, I'm a, little, I'm a little nervous today. Um, okay. Um, and I really did want his opinion on the orange color, so that's how he got his foot in the door, and the rest was history. We were glued together from there on out. Being Matt's significant other was such a joy. He filled my life with so much color and spice. He always had some crazy thing up his sleeve. 
Matt was constantly going and doing, almost at a neck-breaking speed. It was as if he knew his life would be shorter than everyone else's. Every day he would, he would pack so many events into his schedule, and then when he finally came home, he would start working on all his various art projects. A typical day was never typical. I'd find myself helping him move a giant helicopter he somehow got on loan from the Aerospace Museum <laughs> into his living room. Um, on a different day, he would bought a golf cart and he'd be transforming it into a spacecraft for a music video. Over the years, I watched with amazement as he accomplished so much. He bought and sold properties. He helped build a recording studio. He opened and ran a successful restaurant. He made countless short films and music videos. He wrote a television show and produced it himself. He created a green screen improv talk show. He was a musician, a voiceover actor, and a singer. On top of all this, he still found time for me and all of his friendships. He was nothing short of amazing. He was the true definition of a Renaissance man. It wasn't always smooth sailing, of course. <laughs> Matt was a handful. He, he, he wasn't just a handful, he was two heaping handfuls. <laughs> I used to tease him and say, you're not just a ham, you're the whole pig. <laughs> he, he was always the biggest personality in the room. I remember the first night I met him, I'm, I'm sorry, I remember the first night he met my family, my conservative family. <laughs> he, he, he spent the whole night doing Arnold Schwarzenegger impressions. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, Carrey, <clears throat> Jim Carrey once said that behind every great man, there is a woman rolling her eyes. <laughs> well, that was me a lot of the time. But underneath every eye roll, there was a deep well of love and appreciation. The deep love held us together, even through our darker times. He didn't run away when times got tough. He manned up and weathered the storms with me. When I made the difficult decision to quit drinking seven years ago, Matt was my biggest champion. <clears throat> he helped me. That's me, my bad. It's, it's, it's okay, Bryce. We needed a little break. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He helped me to find um, the joy and laughter again. I can honestly say that Matt made me laugh every day for the whole 16 years I knew him. He was by far the funniest person I have ever met. On even the darkest days, he still somehow found the comedy gold. In times like this, it's easy to fall into a deep hole of blackness and despair. So I remind myself, I am so lucky I got to be his wife. I got to live and grow with a man who made me laugh every day. I got to feel what it feels like when someone loves you with their whole heart. I got to witness an amazing being grow and bloom and flourish. I even got to hold his hand and watch him die. I got to be there for him when he needed me, just like he was always there for me. So instead of saying to myself, what a tragedy it is that he died, I say to myself, I am so glad I got to witness him live. Instead of leaning into the... <laughs> instead of leaning into the pain when missing Matt, I lean into the love and laughter he used to surround me with. Even if I knew beforehand that Matt would die so young, I still would have picked him to be my husband. Even with this great tragedy, he was worth it. Matt lived 100 years in his short 45. I'm so lucky I found him and I got to be his bride and waltz through life with him in his crazy ways. I know Matt would want that. I know Matt would want all of us to feel his love in our hearts rather than feel pain every time we remember him. And truthfully, Matt didn't die because he still lives on in all of us. He will forever be a part of me. His giant spirit will be carried on by all of those who were touched by him. Let Matt's influence help you live bold, colorful lives just like he did. When in a crowd or gathering, don't be afraid to interrupt everyone and tell a loud, obnoxious story. <laughs> If you see a delicious meal or dessert, eat it in honor of Matt. <laughs> when you feel like you should go home, stay up later and have that extra drink. 
Call up an old friend, book that trip, take that risk, because that's what Matt would do. So long as you do that, you will never let Matt die. He was never meant to be stopped. He can't be stopped, he won't stop, he will keep living through us. So on that note, <laughs> let's, let's raise a toast to my dear husband, the one and only Matt Hoyt. <laughs> Matt, thank you for your eternal sparkle. We can feel you with us today, and we promise to keep your warmth and spirit with us as we navigate this tough world. Long live Matt Hoyt. Long live love. She said I was a hard act to follow. <laughs> Luckily, I'm not going next. Tim Mays. <laughs> I thought I was third. Uh, I guess I am. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Tim Mays. Um, I, I, how is it that somebody you've been friends with for more than 25 years and worked with for more than 15 is all of a sudden gone one day? I've been asking myself that question for a couple months now, and, and no answer really makes any sense to me. Matt Hoyt and I met through music. I used to book his band Turkey Mount at the Casbah. I don't think I ever saw them perform. Um, I didn't see a lot of bands perform. I couldn't be there every night. But I still can't believe that Matt was a singer in a ska band. <laughs> I also helped him out when he started booking shows at Soul Kitchen in El Cajon in the mid-90s. Uh, he would call me up and ask for advice. I was kind of a mentor to him at the time. But he was super sharp and so smart, and he, he picked it up really fast, and he, he knew what he was doing out there. We stayed in touch, and uh, in his job as a commercial business broker, another one of his hats, uh, he came across a property on India Street back in 2005. And after a few months, he helped me wrangle an SBA loan, which was super hard to do, and I bought the property. There was lots of maneuvering involved in getting the funding, and this is when I first became aware of Matt's uh, persistence and relentless nature. Mountains of documents, bureaucratic red tape, permitting issues were no match for Matt's diligence. At first, Matt's involvement was solely that of a broker, but as the, after the purchase of the property, he decided to get involved on the project that would become Starlight, uh, along with Steve Poltz and a couple other friends. We both agreed we wanted a place that combined classic mid-century design decor with good food, classic cocktails, and late hours so we could eat dinner late because there was nowhere to eat dinner late back then. We hired Bells and Whistles, uh, Jason St. John, Barbara Rourke, Jason Lane to design and build the property. They came to us with all these fantastic ideas. We just kept saying, yes, yes, we need that. Yes, we want that. Yes, 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 do it all. And the restaurant reflects that. Um, such a great uh, classic design there. Um, Matt and I spent nearly a year in that small Starlight office, meeting up for hours pretty much every day as we built the restaurant. It was fun, and it was also stressful at the same time. We cracked each other up all day long, often at the absurdity of what we were doing. We were trying to open a, a relatively fancy restaurant, something neither of us had done before. Um, there were so many things to figure out, dishware, glassware, silverware, tables, chairs, uh, menu, bar staff, kitchen staff, wait staff, hostess, music, permits, all these things that we had to figure out that we'd never dealt with before. Every day a new deluge, deluge of things to deal with. Matt became an expert in all of these aspects of the process pretty much on the fly. He silver-tongued his way out of so many situations with city inspectors, contractors, vendors. Dimitri used to call him Sparkle Mouth because of this ability. <laughs> Dimitri, where are you? Where are you? Put up your hand. Anyways, so he's here somewhere, I hear. 
We were both really, really proud of what we accomplished when Starlight finally opened in June of 2007. Over the years, Matt became a fount of knowledge in how and how not to run a restaurant. <laughs> People from other businesses would call him for advice. Pardon me? Yeah. <laughs> he could have easily become a restaurant or business consultant rather than grinding it out running a restaurant. We had an ongoing joke for the past few years that whenever anybody asked us for advice on opening a restaurant, our first words were, don't do it. <laughs> there, that's the reality of it. Um, mind you, that while Matt was running Starlight 24-7, he was also producing music videos for bands like Pinback and Goblin Cock, doing voiceover work for TV and film, writing, directing, and acting in projects like Antarctica and Talk Talk, Matt would fly out to Sundance every January to network with film friends, drive up to L.A. for the day to meet with folks from Adult Swim or Sci-Fi Network to pitch his latest TV project, or take a few hours to record a voiceover for a commercial. Matt could impersonate anyone. His attention to the detail, cadence, and nuance of someone's speech was uncanny. I know he did impressions of me to people. I never heard one, but I've heard that he was like, spot on. And I, I saw him do impressions of so many people. It was just like, it was heavy rolling in laughter. He was one of the funniest people I've ever known, just like Allison said. And he was also one of the smartest people I've ever known, bar none. Matt was always on. The to-do pile on his desk was never less than four or five inches thick with papers, forms, invoices, inquiries, emails, etc. In all the years we spent huddled in that office at Starlight, the pile never seemed to get smaller. But if you needed to find something, he knew exactly where it was in that pile or in a file or somewhere in the desk. We both loved going to Costco. <laughs> we often joked about starting a podcast about Costco. <laughs> what to buy, what to sample, best times to shop, which locations had the best samples, et cetera, et cetera. The beautiful thing we came to realize about Costco over the years was that you could return just about anything you wanted that you had bought there, even months after you had bought it. That feature came in handy more than once with printers and monitors and stuff that we had to replace at Starlight. During the pandemic, we both became pros at applying for uh, various grants offered by the city, state, county, federal governments. We spoke at great length a few times a week during the pandemic. We'd compare no notes on the processes and vent to each other about all the hoops we, they were making people jump through and the incompetence of a lot of the people administering these potentially life-saving funds. My wife Lucy could always tell if I was on the phone with Matt when I pulled into the driveway and then sat in the car for another 20 or 30 minutes <laughs> finishing our conversation. Um, but there was always something more to talk about and we'd oftentimes have to call each other back because we forgot one thing or another in the heat of the conversation. Um, there were a lot of 1-800-ASK-HOIT uh, calls going on during the uncertain days of the pandemic, not only from me, but from many other like-minded business owners that we were friends with in the community. Like some other, others in our local community, though, Matt and I early on decided to follow county protocols in running our businesses, and this was a long struggle. We were shut down for a long time. Uh, when final, Starlight was finally able to reopen outdoors, I know Matt felt a big weight lifted off his shoulders. Never mind that he still had to deal with many other issues, but he was happy that he could reopen the doors and bring back dedicated employees who were willing to come back to work at that time. Need a teleprompter up here. Uh, Lucy and I would go in for dinner often at Starlight at first, only on the patio, and then indoors when that was reopened. Matt would be there into the night working his ass off to keep that place humming, and there was nobody better for the job. He could do it all, and the staff looked up to him just as we all do, and we all have. Last few times I saw Matt was when we had reopened the Casbah as a cafe standalone bar back in April, May, and June. Matt would often come after Starlight closed and drag the staff over after closing time and sit down and have a nightcap and maybe we'd get up and dance a bit to the DJs that were spinning music in those nights. In early July, a number of us gathered at the Casbah for the Swami Sound System. John Reese was DJing that night and a big dance party broke out. We were all dancing and having a great time. 
Uh, everybody was in a great mood. It was kind of like the reopening of things in early July before the Delta surge came back. So people were feeling free and, and, and able to be out. Matt came up behind me and grabbed me in a big bear hug from behind, right? So, but the combined weight, and he lifted me off my feet, the combined weight of he and I was too much, and we both tumbled to the ground. <laughs> he fell backwards, I fell backwards, and landed on top of him, right? Uh, everybody was like, stop dancing. It was everybody was all freaked out, like, are these guys okay? I mean, there's two big dudes falling on top of each other, right? So everybody stopped, and... I looked at Matt, and we looked at each other, and we got up, and we like, laughed, our, laughed our heads off, and then everybody started dancing again. It was fucking amazing. <laughs> so cool. That, that, that is a fond memory that I will carry with me forever. But I'm still stuck with that question. How can a person simply be gone one day? I love you, Matt Hoyt, and I'm sure you've learned all of the ropes wherever you're at. You are the man up there, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, I also want to thank you so much for saying that we followed uh, all the council guidelines because we actually have a council member here with us today. And it would have been a little awkward if that story went differently. Um, in fact, I want to welcome um, the council president pro temp of San Diego, Stephen Whitburn, to the stage. Thank you very much, Melissa. Hi, everyone. It is great to uh, be able to join you this afternoon to uh, celebrate Matt's life, celebrate the hell out of Matt Hoyt, I think you phrased it. And it's been great to hear the stories uh, that you've told already this afternoon. Great job outwitting those city inspectors, by the way. <laughs> You'll have to show me how to do it sometime. Uh, on the City Council, I have the pleasure of representing District 3. District 3 is the proud home of the Starlight. And obviously, obviously, Matt is beloved, not only in District 3, but across our great city of San Diego, around the region, and far beyond that. And that is why, at uh, this Tuesday's council meeting, I'm going to be introducing a proclamation in Matt's honor. It'll be officially adopted by the City Council and then printed out on proclamation paper. This proclamation has a lot of whereas clauses. <laughs> it has more than 10 whereas, Matt did a lot of stuff, a lot of great stuff. But here are three of them just to give you a little bit of a flavor of it. Whereas Matt Hoyt, co-founder, co-owner, and general manager of Mission Hills Restaurant and Bar Starlight, was a beloved husband, brother, son, uncle, nephew, cousin to dozens, friend to too many to name, restaurateur, filmmaker, artist, musician, comedian, raconteur, whatever that is, and all around merrymaker, and whereas dubbed Hurricane Hoyt, Matt lived multiple lifetimes. In addition to co-founding the beloved Starlight, Matt created performance art, improv acts, short films, and music videos, helped friends acquire and build out businesses, popped up in television shows, video games, and on radio ads with his booming, joyful voice, and played an informal and deeply vital role in connecting the artistic and creative communities of Southern California. Yes. And, whereas, in lieu Whereas, he would go on to become a consummate people connector, befriending musicians, artists, filmmakers, restaurateurs, gallery owners, and comedians. His boundless fervor for others' creativity was infectious. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the mayor and the council of the city of San Diego that this council, for and on behalf of the people of San Diego, does hereby proclaim October 13th, 2021 to be the Matt Hoyt Day in the city of San Diego. Thank you, everyone.
There have been many times that I know Matt is still involved in this event. <laughs> but none so much as just then. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, I can't wait to celebrate the Matt Hoyt Day. Um, <laughs> next up, um, I want, actually I'm going to take, take a quick minute just to tell folks that we've got a lot of like, wonderful people that want to talk. If you guys are getting tired or need to take a little break, um, the Mujeres Brewing Company next door is serving up amazing food and beer, and you can take a little break over there and come on back. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna get a little increasingly like shushy as we go along, so the speeches can be heard. So um, Mujeres next door, get some tacos, come on back. But next up we have the incomparable Ken and Sue Hoyt, Matt's parents. They are beaming in, yeah, they're beaming in, they're here, but they're also beaming in from a video. So watch right over here. The unbelievable outpouring of love for my eldest son, Matthew Joseph Hoyt, underlies my belief that Matt's accomplishment were never and seldom singular accomplishments. They were most often the result of collaboration of many, many people. Just look at the people gathered here today at this wonderful celebration. I must confess that much of his humor was never fully understood by myself. However, his infectious laugh brought tears of laughter to my eyes all the way back to his standing in his crib at age two or three years old, jumping with pure joy with that infectious laugh at a British TV show heard or seen by a guy named Benny Hill. For those of you who've never heard or seen Benny Hill, let me just say he was viewed by most Americans as totally off color with humor filled with sexual innuendo. Let's just say that Matt Hoyt's humor was always unique from the very beginning. Humor and all law and all art is meant to instill new insights into our understanding of the world. Matt Hoyt was an artist. With insights he instilled in you and many friends and family here today. And those insights I can only guess. I know for me, the fact that Matt existed with all his art and ideas was a revolution in my life. Three men changed my life forever. Matt Hoyt, Mark Hoyt, and Tim Hoyt. I once saw the world as a set of rules and absolutes. To say I was orthodox would be an understatement. While I believed I was advancing social justice, I was just making excuses for keeping things from changing. Matt and his two brothers opened a new world for me. With their insights, I was able to see all creation as a miracle. The only rule is love. As long as I am alive, Matthew Joseph Hoyt lives in me. And I deeply believe he lives in all of you. Dearest Matt, much has already been said about you, Matthew Joseph Hoyt, the eldest of three, born on Columbus Day, October 13th, 1975, at St. Jude Hospital in Fullerton, California. You couldn't wait to get there, so of course you arrived a month early. Maddie, 
In looking back at your baby book this past week, I realized just how full of life you were, even at a young age. Everyone who knew you in the early years knew that you never slept. I have told this story countless times about dad sleeping under the crib one night so I could get a good night's sleep. I realized later that you merely wanted out of that crib and you smiled from ear to ear when dad finally picked you up. By the way, you were given the biggest smile award at the Claremont Memorial Park when you were only two years old. Another Hoyt tale. As my sister Marilyn recalls one day when she babysat, she could still hear the wheels on the pavement as you and younger brother Mark raced up and down those sidewalks. With your noisy big wheels grinding the pavement and with your cousin uh, Josh, who lived a few doors down. And of course, that was at 7 a.m. on Saturday morning. We woke up the whole neighborhood. And yes, Matt, you and Mark were busy boys who entered a home as whirlwinds and were known as the horrible Hoyts. My brother Dick noted that all the breakable items in their home were placed high up on the counters. And he remarked to wife Anne Marie, so the Hoyt boys were here playing today, huh? Matt, you were always the consummate compromiser, even at an early age. So when you and your brother, you called Marky at the time, would tussle, you would offer up something, anything, a toy, a cookie, mostly because you didn't want to take a punch in the torso or a smack in the face from your little brother, who was 19 months younger. And of course, I used to dress you both alike. So people or folks would remark, are they twins? But no, Matt, you were unique, uniquely you. In the middle school years, you were always doing amazing things. We called you the Energizer Bunny. You were in your room trying out new passions. Stop motion animation. I didn't even know what that was. Like your claymation videos that you made to the tune of Heard It Through the Grapevine. You love the claymation character Gumby, so one year I even put it on your cake. Many members of the Church of St. Luke remember you scouring the annual rummage sale leftovers each year for items that you could use for your next animation or for a new film. You received your first camcorder at about age 10. Moving on to high school, Matt, do you remember the day that you got your driver's license? Well, I do. You asked if you could take our blue van down the street and grab an ice cream cone. I thought you meant the nearby Baskin Robbins, and little did I know, you filled the van with all your chums and you drove the car all the way to Gelato Vera, which at the time I thought was pretty far, but it's only downtown San Diego. And that would have been okay, but when you returned, one mother called me, and remember, we didn't have cell phones at the time, but before you got home, I knew, and I will never tell who told me. But I comment, she commented that you were spotted turning the corner on Wind River to re-enter the hood while the van door was wide open and all the boys were hanging out the door, waving to everyone, so excited that you got your license. Matt, you also continued to hone in on your short films at this time. There was a bit of childhood endangerment going on one summer, as I recall, when you were babysitting Tim. We used to call him Timmers, and I returned home. And Tiny Tim, as you sometimes called him, was about three or four at the time. And he said, Matt dressed me up again. Mom, no more movies. In 2005, you met the wonderful Allison Bell and married in 2010. You told lots of embellished stories from the backyards of South Park and at our homes in Capri Court and now here in Imperial Beach. I know that you were both ultimately involved in the San Diego art, culture, and music scenes. I was so delighted for the two of you to co-host the Museum of Contemporary Art event in San Diego one year. And I'm also proud for all your awards, especially the San Diego Film Award for Best Music Video filmed right here at Bread and Salt for the sci-fi vision of the song Sherman by Pinback. One final story. I am reminded of a time when you came to a rescue of a girl who lost her mother. I believe this was in high school and I think it was during the turkey mallet years. You and all your friends put on a benefit show and raised money for the girl. And this was so she could pay for her mother's burial. Matt, you were kind and you were generous. 
and you saw the need. And I also know that you picked up the tab and you paid for so many starlight dinners for family and friends over the years because people have told me so recently. Many words have been written about you. Matt always had a smile on his face. He always made me feel good. Matt lived multiple lifetimes in the short time he was with us. Matt was Hurricane Hoyt and the Renaissance man. People like nephew Bryce said, Matt was always full of escapades. He was like the producer of a lot of creative energy in this town and would help everybody, probably most, mostly all of me. He made everybody feel like they mattered. He supported local businesses. He was engaging. His enthusiasm boosted my ego, said somebody. The biggest proponent of everyone he knew. He would always help everyone accomplish whatever they set out to do. He connected the artistic and creative community in San Diego. He's done so much other stuff for art and culture in San Diego and comedy, of course. Running an amazing restaurant like Starlight, founding a beautiful bar and bistro. My biggest cheerleader. And finally, 1-800-CALL-MATT-HOYT. But today we also grieve a bit. Sarah McKellock Lane, my niece, sent me a beautiful piece by a writer named Jamie Anderson on grief, and it makes so much sense. Grief, I've learned, is really just love. It's all the love that you want to give but cannot. It's all the unspent love that gathers up in the corner of your eyes, the lump in your throat, and the hollow part of your chest. Grief is just love with no place to go. And yes, we all grieve for Matt, but Matt would really want us to move forward, wouldn't he? And so we will. Matt, so many friends and relatives have disclosed to me that your untimely death has changed their life forever, but in a constructive way. Phrases like, don't put off what you can do today. Make amends with those you love. Or why am I waiting to do X? have become a call to action for all these people. Thank you, Matt, for awakening that in all of us. In closing, we'd like you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the Matt Hoyt retrospective. What else can you say about a guy who's a legend? I love you, Matt. You will always be with me. Mom. I first met Matt's parents after Matt may have done one or two impressions of his parents. <laughs> but I will say that those impressions were born out of so, so much love. Um, one of the things that I thought about when Allison and Matt got married was how lucky Allison was to be marrying into a family so full of love. Um, and that's really what you both provided for him. Um, so thank you. <laughs> Up next, in a total change of pace, we have a green man somewhere in the audience. There's someone who is fully green. Please welcome Casey Butler to the stage. Thank you. Uh, I titled my speech, uh, Captain Matt. It's not really a theme that comes back, but it's true. Matt was the captain. For sure. Um, my name is Casey Butler, and I have been a best friend of Matt's for many years since meeting him in high school. Uh, we shared so much of our lives together as creative artists and as loving friends. And our dreams and hopes 
were converged and mutual. Matt lived a life of exceeding potential. He was a genius of storytelling, and he exhibited an honorable level of communication and heart in all of the lives that he touched. His ability to project confidence and strive for achievement was unmatched. I believe most of us could feel an authenticity of spirit and drive immediately upon being in his presence. And I have been in love with his unique and boundless energy from our very first meeting. I most certainly will forever be longing to have more of those moments. The shadow cast in this loss leaves a void that, leaves, that feels so unbearably impossible to fill. The strong magnetism that we all share towards Matt now draws us to a space that is unfamiliar and quiet. As we pull together and pour our hearts towards each other, as we grieve and commune, as we archive and recount memories, as we show up and reach out for each other, we should remain aware that we are slowly and steadily building a way to console ourselves together as a group. My wish for Matt's memory, his family and loved ones, is that we can find more and more importance in making those efforts to stay connected. We have all been alarmed by this sudden change and there's a call for the appropriate reaction. For a large group of misfits such as ourselves, I believe we need to search our souls deeper and gently so we can devote ourselves to supporting each other more and with increasing sensitivity. Right now, we need each other more than ever before, and it has been so heartening and beautiful to see the effort, care, and concern that has been displayed in these last weeks, preparing to come together to mourn the loss and also to celebrate the life of our most beloved Matt. Matt was quite purely motivational to friends and creative folk and he had the power to get people excited in all the best ways about shared passions, art, music, philosophy, spirituality, and even the tumultuous and shifting nature of our world. Matt wanted to help make the world better and more just. And he made me feel as if I was recruited to be a part of that mission. I think a lot of people here can relate to that feeling of being recruited by Matt, whether it was for a silly ruse, a wacky or oddball film project, a shopping trip, a gathering of minds, or just sharing intellect and your best wild ideas in the late hours of the night when the magic would often get brewed. This feeling of recruitment was such a gift that he gave gracefully and I am learning in these recent weeks that to me it means more than ever I realized. Matt understood the sense of belonging that everyone wants and needs. And he was attuned to providing that inclusiveness and belonging for so many different people in so many different parts of his life. In creative pursuits, in business, or just friendship. Our friend JP said most aptly that Matt was the unofficial mayor of Friendship Town. <laughs> and it's so true. I think Matt was a trailblazer who helped to create more space for those who might not have such a bold voice. I always felt so supported and empowered with Matt and being on his team felt like being on the winning team all the time. I feel so lucky to have had a place at his very large table 
and to have had the opportunity to be considered important by him as a friend and collaborator. Matt covered so much territory and his space was always a fun place to be in. I'm so grateful for all the fun times that I had with Matt, so many shows, drives, concerts, visits, trips, and parties. They seem to be countless, and each flowing memory is constantly reminding me of how rich life can be. Where will we now get our most ridiculous and gut-busting stories? <laughs> Matt had a knack at delivering the most ridiculous and colorful stories that would have everyone in the room in stitches. We will surely miss having that bounty, but we got a new space illustration, a heaven-sent proclamation centered on the path to your future. It's larger than the last, planting a garden from the past into space and to the future. Do I have green makeup on this side of my face now? <laughs> Casey said something, he said a lot of beautiful things just now, but one thing that he said that I've been thinking about a lot is that he was one of Matt's best friends. And this was a special talent of Matt to make us all feel like we were his best friend. Um, it's so incredible to have someone that can make you feel like you're the most important person in the room. And Matt did that every single interaction that he had every single day. So I, without further ado, I'm going to introduce another best friend of Matt's, uh, Angel Baker. Please come on up. Right. Everybody. I'm Angel. Um, Do you want me to hold it? No, sure, sure. Um, I just want to say, I'll hold it. It's been a super duper honor to be here today and be amongst all the people that Matt included in his orbit. Um, I'm very dear to the Bell family and I'm so happy to see all the Bells here. Um, when I found out that we lost Matt, my first thought was, I have to write him down. It, it's imperative, and he believed in me as much as he believed in you, in my writing and my work, 
and it felt more urgent than ever to start doing the stuff that I've been afraid to do. Um, and I think that I've heard that a lot from a lot of people to just not wait, like Sue Hoyt said, don't wait, don't hesitate, take that risk, do that project, take that trip. So I have a short piece that I wrote for Matt, as much for Matt as for me and for us who are feeling that weird void um, since he has left us in the physical form. So this is called For Matt, For Us. The proud bloom of summer cactus flowers delivers another blow in the wake of your death. The world will mistake new beginnings for new seasons when only we have your end. So we make our memories replay forever in eight millimeter, reels clacking on and on. So we will delight in your on-screen Eunice, young, proud, earnest. Your skin not yet spotted by age, that thick 70s John Travolta hair not yet graying. Your eyes never dulled, endless ideas never too ridiculous, keeping each other company in your mind until illuminated from the inside out like a Christmas tree through the window of a nearby house. Celebratory, bright, magic. We were lucky to enjoy that spark, that life, that duty to create. Matt, you are now the bedtime film we won't ever stop playing. We stupidly expected to have more time with you. We hoped the real-time reels would keep clacking on, a slower deterioration of spotted film, skipped dialogue, dust on the shelves. Perhaps we hoped even secretly for a miracle of time, your life so big and so bold could be drawn out like a Neil Hamburger set. <laughs> Matt would really appreciate that reference. <laughs> that maybe would allow us time to get prepared, to get ourselves in order. As if that would make sense of this nonsense. But order, like summer, supposedly just comes. So we walk in that blue constant counterfeit, a reality empty of you, one foot in front of the other, until the extended body of your life is absorbed into a new body, our bodies. You hear the dead keep on living in the living. You hear that it is only midnight in a cave until someone flashes a light. And Matt, you were that light. Matt, we are the caves, we are the living. You've been that light, and you will be that light. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. All right, uh, totally fine. <laughs> uh, up next, I have one request from Sue Hoyt to go to Muhari's Brewing Company. No, I'm sorry, Muhari's Brew House if you want to chat. And if you want to stay here, we have a video from the brothers, Tim and Mark, and their families up next. You don't come across a lot of Matt Hoyts in your life. Fortunately for me, I was lucky enough to have one in mine. Matt was talented at a lot of things. His resume is well known. He used to tell me that he thought of himself as Renaissance Matt because he worked so hard to be good at so many things. But to me, Matt was my older brother first. We spent a lot of time together growing up. I have a lot of memories of the times Matt and I shared. Too many to list but the ones that come to mind first, I'll never forget. I'll never forget his early days of film production where he experimented with stop motion photography and low budget pyrotechnics. On more than one occasion, my mom would ask us where all the rubbing alcohol kept going. We pretended that we had no idea knowing full well that we use the entire bottle to simulate napalm in our after school war reenactment movies. A lot of good little green men lost their lives those days. I'll never forget the pranks we played on our elderly babysitter, Mary, 
Matt installed a speaker in the living room that he controlled from his bedroom so he could play sound effects to mess with her. My favorite was when he played the sound of a telephone ringing and Mary would run to pick up the phone to find that nobody was on the other end. Matt, of course, installed a camera in the living room so he could watch all of this on a monitor in his bedroom. I'll never forget his musical years as the lead singer of the internationally acclaimed rock sensation Turkey Mallet. I was honored to serve as their occasional roadie and videographer during Matt's musical years. There are so many more memories that I could write a book about, but they wouldn't be as well written without Matt. Matt was a big part of a lot of great moments in my life. For all those moments and, and for the per person Matt was, I will forever be grateful. Love you, brother. I will miss you always. Matt, I'll never forget your humor and how I always look forward to hanging out with you and listening to your funny stories and your impersonations. I loved hearing about your childhood memories. Your stories were so hilariously captured. Every year, we would go to Starlight for my birthday. Matt knew I liked this sparkling buy drink. And one year, Matt went and bought a bunch of them and had the bartender make all these fun drinks for me that night. It was the nicest thing. You were always listening. You were the best brother-in-law, and I will always be proud to be your sister-in-law. Cheers. The thing that I'll never forget about Matt is um, it was actually pretty recently. It was at the height of COVID and uh, Matt was remodeling uh, or was putting tile down in some of the kitchens at Granada. So he had called me up um, and asked if he could borrow me and my truck for like an hour. I knew it was going to be much, much longer than that because that's how it always went. Um, so I get over um, I meet Matt at Lowe's in Mission Valley. We get there, Matt, we needed 32 boxes of this like backsplash type tile that we were using for the floor. I shouldn't say we, he was having a guy come in from Arizona. We need to get all the tile that night because he had a guy coming in from Arizona who was going to sleep in the apartments and do the tile in both kitchens over the weekend. So we had to get all the tile that night. So I met Matt at uh, Lowe's Mission Valley and he said, oh, it's all set. Like I ordered it online. Like they have all the boxes. We need to like 30 boxes. We get there and like, I don't know if this was just Matt's bad luck, but it always seemed to happen. Like they didn't have it or the order was wrong, but they had three boxes of tile. <laughs> so we got the three boxes of tile. We got everything else that the tile guy needed. And we, uh, we drove back to Granada and we unloaded everything. And that was all super stressed trying to figure out what to do because he needed to get all this tile. Um, so he turned to me and he was like, here, have you ever had Trace Agave's tequila? I was like, yeah, it's, it's good. And he was like, it's great. Let's just drink some tequila. We'll regroup. We'll get our minds together. Um, I was like, he's like, tequila, tequila energizes me. And I was like, okay, I don't really need an excuse to drink the tequila, but sure, <laughs> let's have some tequila. So um, he didn't have any cups or anything. So we just had to drink it out of the bottle. We both took a shot or whatever. And then after a while, we figured out that we were just, he found all the other lows in San Diego County that had the tile. So after, after about an hour or so, um, we drove around from Lowe's to Lowe's. I think we went to Santee, then East Lake. We went all the way up to Poway, searching all day or grabbing like nine boxes here, seven boxes there, just so we could get the 32 boxes of tile. Um, it just seemed like everywhere we went, like something went wrong, but that was either classic Matt or just pure bad luck for that day. But I didn't mind because I had a good time hanging out with Matt. And it was fun to drive around with him and help him. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Kinsley's passed out. <laughs> but there she is. Um, we'll never forget the, the time that we went out. I mean, this was probably one of the only times that it was just me. Carlin and Matt, but it was the or the night before our wedding. Um, Matt had come down 
somehow late, me and Carla and Matt ended up late night at the Forum, which was the little hole in the wall bar across from where I got married, drinking black cherry white claw and shots of Don Julio tequila. <laughs> I think he knew everybody needed a little bit of a stress relief mm. before the big day. Yeah. So that was really fun. I mean, it was just kick back, hanging out with Matt. Um, it was one of the few times he wasn't very stressed, which was nice. So, uh, I'll never forget Matt trying to name the baby all kinds of oh, crazy that's, that's things. true. <laughs> like a uh, snowy Capri. A snowy Capri or like, Spang- Sadie Spanky Jones or <laughs> I forget. What, there was tons of taco shop. And- yeah, very <laughs> names we will never use, <laughs> but. Uh, but he was trying to be very involved in the naming of mm-hmm. Kinsley. So, but thank you, Matt, for <laughs> we went we stuck with Kinsley though. Yeah. All right, we love you. Right, I love miss you. you. See you soon. Did anyone see the shrimp drawer yet? No, we haven't talked about the shrimp drawer. No? Yeah, it was Christmas Eve, it was, it and was. Nana wanted to have a sushi experience yes. at home. Yes. Yeah, and but yeah. he sourced all the fish. He got fresh fish from the fish Yeah, Matt fish handled the, mm-hmm. the fresh yeah. fish, and he brought all, over all the goods, and yeah. then we were, like, chopping and prepping, and, yeah. and we had a platter of cocktail shrimp. Papa knocked over, like, this little plastic tray. And then we were like, what happened? To the shrimp. It and took everybody a long time to figure yeah, out. We did, yeah, we didn't even know Papa had knocked over, by yeah. the way. We had no, we, we didn't even know that genu- happened. Like, we genuinely, like, we genuinely had no idea, like, where they went. We thought they disappeared, and it took us, like, a good, like, 25 minutes to realize, like, what actually happened. Oh, because Matt <laughs> then opened the drawer yeah, because, to get scissors. And he was like, oh, that's where they went. That and then we started shrimp. Like, yeah, and then we all started laughing hysterically, and like Matt, Matt like put on this voice, and he was like, "Where's the shrimp? Oh, it's in the drawer, of course." <laughs> oh, he was doing Julia Childs. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. The shrimp. Oh, the shrimp. You go to the shrimp. Yeah. <laughs> you put the shrimp in your pan in the drawer. You go to. If you're gonna make a shrimp, did you go to the shrimp drawer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every time, like, my friends would be like, oh, do you have, like, a cool uncle? And I was like, oh, yeah, I have the coolest uncle. And his name is Matt. Mm-hmm. All right, this is a lot of good footage. Yeah. Getty still. Yeah, I'll stop. I'll stop. Good. I think that's good, right? Are we good? I think we got a lot of good oh, footage. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, great stories. Amazing. Yeah. No, you had some good stories. I think this is great stuff. And by the way, I'm still recording. <laughs> 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 yeah, I never stopped it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, no. <laughs> and now, now I'm going to get up and stop it. <laughs> <Jeez, I> just... <laughs> oh, oh. Here's for you, Matt. I don't, uh, it's not Trace Agaves, but something just as good. I want to thank Tim and Mark for having to suffer the younger brother role for so many years because when Matt became my older brother, (laughs) he was an experienced teaser, uh, an experienced prankster, um, and uh, only joshed me a little bit. I think that I never had to dress up in crazy costumes like Tiny Tim did. Up next, I want to invite uh, the wonderful George to the stage. Uh, George is a dear friend of Matt's um, from the filmmaking world, and he's going to give a little talk about his relationship with Matt. There you go. Thank you. All right. uh, Hi, everyone. Uh, I am not good at speeches. I wrote some notes, uh, and I kind of just wanted to talk about some of the things that happened in mind and Matt's relationship. And I don't mean to steal from Casey at all, but our friend Alex always called him the mayor of San Diego, and I feel like as we've listened to these speeches today, I think it's very much uh, ac- an accurate statement. Um, and as uh, the other thing I wanted to add as I get into this uh, talk, uh, my stories are probably going to be very boring compared to Matt's, who would embellish with impersonations, acting everything out, uh, extending it and making it as funny as humanly possible. Mine are all like two sentences. <laughs> so bear with me. 
Um, so I first met Matt in film school at San Diego State in 2001. We were in a musical class together, and I was very depressed to have to be in a musical class, and I thought it was a requirement. The teacher was going to require multiple, like three or four 10-page papers. First class, kind of sad. Second class, M Matt raises his hand and points out to the teacher that students who started, started in this fall semester 2001 weren't actually required to be in this class. He and I started sem fall semester 2001. I hadn't bothered reading the syllabus he had. Um, as part of the class, we had to exchange our email contact, so I kind of, I didn't have a syllabus, so I emailed him when I got home. An hour later, he called me from his real estate job. We ended up having a two and a half hour long conversation, found out I can drop the musical class, he invited me to the Casbah to see Blackheart and Plesiosaur that Saturday, uh, or Friday or Saturday, uh, and then, you know, show up Florida Street that night, and I meet everyone who would then become my friends to this day, uh, Dimitri, Jason, Lee, Matt Brees, uh, you know, everyone's there. Go to the Casbah show. We're working on Tropics of Love, Blackheart Procession the next summer, uh, the entire, you know, the entire summer splitting between Tropics of Love, the movie, and also uh, a, a film that we were working on called Escape Artists, which unfortunately ever, never got finished. But um, I kind of wanted to go through a few of those memories uh, with that. Um, yeah, a few things that kind of stand out to me. Uh, first, on the Escape Artists, um, Matt had set up something with the Palomar Club that uh, 6 a.m. shoot, the owner assured him that no one was ever there that early. They would open the doors, we could kind of go in, shoot this bar scene, no problem. We get there at like 5.45, there's a line of old, old guys waiting to get let in because, you know, they gotta get their drink on. Uh, so we try to shoot there. These guys are catcalling and talking the entire time. So, you know, we're like two or three hours in, nothing's working sounds horrible, and Matt has a solution. I can just call Tim Mays, we can go to the Casbah. Half an hour later, we're sitting in the Casbah shooting the scene, done, goes great. Um, then thinking on uh, shooting Blackheart that summer as well, and I think this is something that kind of just like bleeds into everything Matt did. Uh, still living at Florida Street at that time, and we're shooting Dimitri on a broken down motorcycle, green screen paint behind, behind him. Uh, fishing line tied to a scarf that we were kind of pulling off, off stage to make it look like wind was blowing. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're getting the scene. A few years later, Jason Cherry is building a, uh, a cave in the backyard for uh, the Goblin Cock video, like life-size cave as big as this Talk Talk stage. Um, right, so then, you know, uh, something else, just another story. Uh, back to Escape Artist that summer as well. Uh, we went up to San Francisco to shoot the scene for an Escape Artist. And, uh, you know, everything's fine. First day, great. Me, Matt, and our friend Damon decided to go out drinking, and for whatever reason, we were all only drinking Long Island iced teas that night, and that's what was happening. I blacked out at some point, but we made it back to the hotel room, which we were supposed to shoot in the next day. I woke up, 7 a.m., I think the shoot's supposed to be at 9. I'm in bed in my underwear with Damon, Matt's in the other bed, and I was just like panicking, couldn't find my glasses, looking everywhere. They end up being in my pants, which are on Damon's side of the bed, uh, <laughs> which were filled with puke. <laughs> uh, hotel room trash. So then, you know, we get up and we're like frantically cleaning because we have to shoot in two hours. We have real actors coming. Again, you know, nick of time, everything works out. We get it done, we make the shoot. Um, you know, there are many stories like that. Uh, every music video was an adventure, every short film was an adventure. Uh, those are sort of like the funner moments for me. Uh, the one other thing I kind of wanted to touch base about was I was very tangentially part of Matt and Allison's first date, first official date, not the meeting, 
uh, at the bar, at uh, wherever you were. I forget where you said now. Yes, yeah, Imperial House. Um, I was watching League Pass with him at his apartment, and he was just like, oh, hey, I'm going to go on a date with this girl. You can stay here and watch League Pass, NBA League Pass, if you want. I was like, okay, cool. And it, so I stayed around for like half an hour after he left. Turns out that that date was with Allison, and, you know, the rest is history. Um, I left San Diego in 2007 for New York. Uh, you know, Matt and I would, uh, my wife's from, oh, I skipped an entire very important thing, actually, for me, for me personally. Um, and maybe I'll just close with this. Um, Matt to San Diego, my introduction to now what I consider my lifelong friends. Uh, you know, Matt was my lifelong friend. Um, uh, he, Matt Brees, and I went to Landmark Hillcrest Cinemas to see Haiku Tunnel. Uh, Brees and he decided that I shouldn't be working at Zany Brainy, which is where I was working at the time, and I should work at Landmark. And uh, Matt and uh, Brees introduced me to Landmark. I subsequently ended up working in publicity for them, which subsequently led me into film distribution and everything else that I'm still doing to this day. So I credit him with my career. I also credit him with my, meeting my wife, who I met at Landmark. We were both working, working floor staff. Like, really, I feel like everything since my moving here in 2001, I owe to him. Uh, yeah, and then just one last anecdote, uh, and then I'll go. In the interview for Landmark, uh, Brent Asbury, I don't know if he's here or not, but he was, he was the manager at the time, and he interviewed me. And the interview was basically Brent saying, so you're friends with Matt, right? And I was like, yeah. He's like, so I'm going to sit here and this, smoke this cigarette, but you pretty much got the job. <laughs> That, that was all I needed. It was the best interview ever. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, sorely missed. So thanks for giving me the time. All right. Eric Lancaster, where are you? Eric, he's coming up here. Another very dear friend of Matt's. Here you go. Thank Round you. of applause. Uh, Matt and I did lots of things together where we were extremely nervous or didn't know what the hell we were doing. And this is absolutely one of those things. So I wrote a bunch of stuff down the last few weeks and I'm gonna try and read some of it and try not to be too long. Uh, I met Matt Hoyt in 1983, second grade. I don't think he started the year in our class. At some point, he came in as a new kid. It did not take very long for us to hit it off. When I found out he lived in my neighborhood and his house was a short bike ride away from mine, my world changed. I can still see the first time walking up to his front door. This was 80s American suburbia, just like the movie Over the Edge. The sun was bright and the days were long. Our families were the first inhabitants of these new, strange, sprawling, look-alike stucco dwellings. The neighborhood, known as Cottonwood, seemed like a blank canvas, and we were eager to splatter it with turpentine and dirt. One time in second or third grade, as we were all sitting on the floor waiting for the teacher to read to us, Matt turned to me and said, Eric, look, butts. And he indented the skin on his chin to look like a human rear end. I thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever seen in my life, and I remember having to stifle my giggles in vain and practically dying from not being able to laugh as much as I wanted to so I would not get in trouble. It's totally amazing, still to this day. In 1985, Matt and I went to see Pee Wee's Big Adventure when it came out. We loved Pee Wee Herman. Matt brought his own candy to sneak into the movie, which I thought was cool and I had never seen done before. Shortly after the movie started, I heard Matt fumbling around in the flickering dark, negotiating with his personal and possibly excessive sugar stash. All of a sudden, I heard what sounded like a hailstorm exploding into the relative quiet of the theater as Matt generously deposited half a box of lemon heads onto the concrete floor. We were cracking up, of course, and for a brief moment, what was going on in the dark next to me was actually more entertaining than what was happening on screen. That was the first and last time I ever ate a lemon head. In the summer of 1987, Matt and I did a puppet concert. The event took place in the reliable daytime darkness of Matt's parents' garage. We used stuffed animals, flashlights, and a rad mixtape of music curated by me including songs by Van Halen, Aerosmith, Motley Crue, Kiss, Poison, and probably Autograph, among others. We would take empty U-Band coffee cans and turn them on their sides, and they became bass drums. 
The drum set was double bass with drums made out of toilet paper rolls and straw cymbal stands with plastic lids as the cymbals, all taped together with masking tape. I really wished I could uh, actually play the drum set because it was so fancy and professional. We constructed a stage using the plethora of white storage boxes all around us in the Hoyt garage. The puppet band's name was Disease, and I designed a sleek logo, which of course was on the front of the bass drums. Somehow we talked two or possibly three kids down the street to actually attend our concert so that we would have a live audience. And we even made tickets for the show, which I'm almost certain were free. <clears throat> Matt's brother Mark would help with the flashlight show and was also in charge of operating the video camera because, of course, the concert was filmed. There was even a guitar solo, at least two encores, and a drum solo performed by our drummer, Sud Z, the mascot for Joy Lemon dishwashing liquid. He's sitting right over there. Sud Z had very long arms and the perfect body type to be a stuffed animal drummer, and we agreed. It was Sud Z's destiny to be the drummer of disease. Thanks. Uh, you could say it was written in the Suds. One day, Matt picked me up before school, and a camera was sitting on top of the van. He had forgotten it up there, and somehow it had stayed on top of the van for the entire car ride from Matt's house to mine. Another day, possibly the same one, Matt confused a can of WD-40 with a can of deodorant. I think he burned his armpits. And then there was a the time Matt attempted to iron a shirt while he was wearing it. All of Matt's crazy stories he would somehow justify to me. All it would take was a skeptical smirk to provoke the familiar refrain. No, Eric, you don't understand. If only I had a dime for every time I heard this phrase. I can hear Matt's voice and miscellaneous amusing rationales in my head as clear as day. Matt was the kind of person you played with in a band who would turn their amp on without looking at any of the settings, like volume, for instance, or even being aware if their guitar was plugged in or not. Thus, I was acutely aware of what Matt was doing at practice at all times, always ready for the moment when Matt would turn his stuff on so I could plug my ears and wait it out in relative safety. This reminds me of driving home from shows in high school. Many times we were coming home from shows downtown at Soma or from the Che Cafe in La Jolla, very tired with long midnight drives ahead of us. Matt would start up the van and immediately whatever god-awful punk rock that we had been blasting on the way to the show would fill up the often freezing van with violent hellish noise. I was used to getting in the back of the van, huddling up with my hood over my head and then spending the entire ride home fantasizing about the warmth and comfort of my bed. Matt invariably would have the windows down no matter what time of year, and the volume of the music would stay more or less the same, i.e. loud, for the entire car ride home, much to my metaphysical discomfort. It was almost as if he had no control over these things. They were just necessary extensions of his personality, for better or worse. And even though they could drive me crazy, I knew I loved them as such. Matt liked to say that he threw up every time he played a show. While I can't say whether or not this is true, there are a couple of stories that illustrate this fact. When we were seniors in high school, we got our first show at the Casbah, March 14th, 1994. I feel like I have a hair on my face. I daydreamed about it for months, wandering the miserable halls of Ahala in total disbelief, doubting that it would actually ever happen, like a starry-eyed somnambulist. When the day of the show finally arrived, we were ready. We wore our fancy white shirts, and I had a new hi-hat. The show was sparsely attended, but we were no strangers to empty rooms. We had to sit outside until we played since we were underage, beneath the flight path of landing airplanes at the San Diego International Airport. Over the years, we were lucky enough to play the Casbah five or six times, and this was the routine for every occasion. Every experience we had at the Casbah was special. The sound was great on stage, and I think we always felt a little spoiled. I remember once we even got paid $50. Unfortunately, our set on this particular night was fraught with technical difficulties. From the start, it was apparent that Matt's infamous Memphis guitar was in no mood to cooperate. The jack was messed up, and throughout the entire show, the guitar is consistently cut off by a terrible squealing sound, like something straight out of Spinal Tap. At one point, Matt desperately looks up to Casey and I in a state of apologetic panic, and all Casey and I can do is stare at him. I think we were all relieved to finally make it to our last song, another typical 10-minute epic. During the crescendo of the song, Matt seems to transcend, if only into the weird apartment upstairs from the club. After inexplicably intentionally hitting his head on my cymbal like some sort of bodily rock and roll sacrifice, in a moment of total punk rock possession, Matt can be seen flying all over the stage and jerking wildly to the final, tribal, rhythmic climax of the song like a marionette on fire. As Casey and I lay into the beat, playing our guts out to the vacant dance floor on a school night, Matt suddenly stops on a dime, drops his guitar, and stumbles down over to Hunch in the corner, apparently puking into his hand or a solo cup or both. 
After a minute, Matt rallies and for a brief moment tries to join back in with Casey and I, but the guitar is still electrically disadvantaged and is just a sad exercise in futility. Needless to say, we were very disappointed and discouraged in our night, but better nights were in store for us there in the future. While the videotape of the show was never Matt's or Casey and I's proudest moment, I know in the years since we could return to it and laugh at our misfortune, while perhaps also feeling a little sorry for ourselves. Another story Matt liked to tell involved Turkey Mallet's CD release show, December 8th, 1995. We played in our breathtaking backyard, El Cajon, at our familiar stomping grounds, the Soul Kitchen. Turkey Mallet actually played the first and last shows at this venue. Our friends Real Big Fish and Deadbolt were nice enough to open the show for us. It was an electric night of positive energy, excitement, and hope. Little did the audience know this hope would take a slimy projectile form halfway through Ska Demon. Almost done. As Matt often told me, he felt the familiar queasiness coming on, and in the midst of singing, he had to pause and cover his mouth, dramatically turning away from the audience in a desperate attempt to shield them from his metamorphosis, kind of like Michael Jackson in the Thriller video. But on this particular occasion, instead of discreetly trying to take care of his business in a cup or in his hand off to the side of the stage, Matt did something different. In a glorious moment of righteous catharsis, Matt removed his hand from his mouth and dramatically turned to unleash his lunch on some unlucky audience members, continuing to sing without missing a beat and brushing aside the vomit, or scomit, if you will, like just another infatuated groupie. It was a dis disgusting thing that would have made Gigi Allen proud. I know it made me laugh, and I love to hear Matt recount this story and pantomime the legendary moment. I remember the night when we found ourselves on Proctor Valley Road in Hamol. We did not know where it went, and as we slowly probed further and further along the under-maintained dirt road, our commitment to finding the end only increased. At one point, we were sure a car was following us in the distance, which only added to our paranoia and sense of danger, real or imagined. Words were few and far, and broke the silence in excited whispers. Dude, where are we? I don't know, I think we're in Mexico. What if we see a blue person? The silent hills loomed and drew imperceptibly closer. The silhouette of the ridge line only enhanced the darkness, weakly interrupted by the van's trying headlights. Our naive excitement was eclipsed only by our collective fear, and we held our breath and gazed giddily out the windows like wide-eyed idiots into that starry and different dark, waiting for the UFO that we were sure would swoop down and take us away at any moment. We were at the mercy of the smeared cosmic void outside the windshield before us, a windshield that was not unlike a screen in a darkened movie theater, and we could not have been happier. After all, this was a situation that we had dreamed about for all of our brief lives, whether or not we knew we had dreamed about it. The abyss was gazing back at us, and our formless minds were stirred. That was the night we discovered that Proctor Valley Road ends up just, as just another paved street in a quiet, unassuming Chula Vista suburb. <clears throat> However, sorry. However, we were sure we had just been deposited into the twilight zone. Back then, that was how you discovered things, by just doing them. You drove down a dark road together until you found out where it went, which is a good metaphor for friendship. You tighten your seatbelt, mutter a curse word or three under your breath, and dig your nails into the armrest, like I did the time that Matt navigated us the wrong way down a one-way street, which I know for a fact happened on more than one occasion. With Matt, I was always down for the ride, alien abduction be damned, and I know I'm all the better for it. Matt taught me time and time again that life was about the journey and not the destination. I don't really know what life will be like without Matt because I don't remember too much before I was seven years old. I have no idea what I did in a past life to be lucky enough to, not lucky enough to be friends with Matt so long in this life, but I know I am blessed. My memory is an embarrassment of riches. Matt was the regular mile marker of my life. In the past few weeks, I have wondered how much joy a person can be filled with or how it is even possible. I will be forever grateful to Ken and Sue for creating one of the best friends I will ever have and for nurturing us and enabling us to run wild with our, our imaginations for so many years. I guess I just wish I would have said thank you to Matt more often, but it probably would have felt awkward. So for what it's worth now, thank you, Matthew. Thank you so much, Eric. That was beautiful. Um, I want to invite Paul up to the stage next up. And I'm going to just give you guys a little bit of a clue about the rest of the, uh, the program. 
We're going to have a little bit of time if anyone wants to speak, just a few minutes, not a ton. So if you want to say a few words, know that at some point in the next two speeches, I'm going to invite you up on stage. So quick warning. Paul, are you here? He is here. Give a round of applause for Paul. Uh, thank you. Uh, and here I am standing here. I think I'm speaking for a group of our friends that can't speak because it's very difficult. So give me a moment. I, I have to prepare myself. I've done this before. I've been up in front of people before. People who know me know that I'm a musician. I've been up on stage, but this is different. I wrote words. I swear it's here somewhere. But anyways, I've been Matt's friend for a really long time. And there's a group of us. I don't know why they picked me. They thought I knew. I'm a, apparently, I'm a big crybaby. I didn't know I was such a crybaby. But I'm a huge fucking crybaby. I'm a big fucking crybaby. So fuck. Excuse my French family. Anybody who's in Matt's family or offended by anything I'm going to say. Thank you. I'm a big fucking crybaby, apparently. So you don't, and this is with all due respect to his family, you don't pick your family. You end up with them. But you pick your friends. You pick your friends. And when I met Matt, I picked him. He picked me. I don't know. I was lucky enough. But Matt is my friend and was my friend. And I was lucky enough to meet him. And I was like, that dude is my friend. And I don't know. It just, it's when you, all of us know this about Matt. But when I met Matt, that guy is my friend. So I wrote some stuff. That was my introduction right there. I'm Paul. We did the Tropics of Love. It's in the retrospective. I was honored that they put us in there. We worked on that together tirelessly. But we were friends before that. And I was like, if I'm going to have anybody help me, it's going to be Matt to help me. Because he was the organizer of all organizers. I needed Matt's help. I went to Matt. So here we go. That's my introduction. Here's what I wrote amongst a bunch of tears. Uh, I can picture Matt now in heaven. He's got it all figured out, right? He has a job for everyone. He's got a place for everybody to live. He's got an apartment complex in the sky. He knows all the best bars and all the rest restaurants. He knows the best viewpoints from heaven. He's going to take you there all the way when it's our time. He has a job lined up for everybody. He can get us to the front of the line talking to God. He's got a special in. Actually, Matt is fine. I'm not worried about Matt. It's all of us here that are kind of fucked, right? Having to live this life without Matt is difficult, beyond words. I have to read every once in a while. I should probably take off my glasses and put on my old band glasses. I printed it big. <laughs> Look at that. Look at the size of that font. It's not going to take me long if I can get through. <laughs> no, no, I'll do it. I want to handle this. How I got it. <laughs> I'm a trained professional. <laughs> All right. All right. Get, get the reading glasses on. 
All right. I got a hanky. Somewhere is my handkerchief. Okay. Uh, life goes by so fast. But Matt left memories like caverns, like valleys. Um, and it will remain with us in our hearts. Matt was a larger-than-life character in all of our lives. He was not here to hide in the background, but to play or to play a supporting role. He was the main fucking character in his life. He was going to write and direct life. And when you couldn't play your part, he was going to show you how to do it. Seriously, Matt was going to be like, this is how you do it, Paul. Okay, you're having trouble with this, Paul. This is how you do it. Um, Matt was our friend, our boss, our landlord, our bandmate, a movie personality, a talk show host, a brother, a son, a husband, a confidant, an anchor, our guide, playing the part like a priest in a confessional booth. Let's get rid of that page. Oh, just give me a second. Uh, okay. It's the oxymoron of death that it contains such horrible sadness and darkness, yet it holds the realization of this fortunate offer to be opportunity to the gift that we are given, this beautiful, mysterious, as mysterious as gift, as the death itself. Death, pain, and sorrow is something we all have to go through. We can't avoid it. It's part of all of our stories. We just don't discuss it. We don't talk about it much. We hide it away in the background because it's too painful. Death is only a small part of our story. It's just the last part right here. It's just that moment. Let's not let us scar us of Matt. We don't have to have the scar of Matt considering Matt's face as death. It's what, what's between birth and death that is our story, the true story that we leave in this reality here as we move on to the next reality. And so now, now death can become beauty, right? Death is beautiful. Death is beautiful for all of us because that's Matt. It happened. Matt's beautiful. if that makes any sense at all to anybody but me. Yeah, uh, let me find my place. It's not a symbol of sadness and pain, but the luck and the experience and the great times together that we walked on this world surrounded by good times and good people that we loved. I also believe this hurt us all because Matt was taken so early and that we have to live without him and we can't share that with the rest of the world, how awesome Matt was. But that's our secret, right? We know that. Ah, oh, shit. It's hard to realize that Matt is gone. That's another thing I ever... Physically, he's gone. But he's here with us, with a lot to share, with the people in our, that we hold in our hearts, with our stories. I know we're all hurting, but let's remember how amazing it is to be alive for Matt. Because Matt would want us to be living and doing all the things that we're doing in our lives for ourselves, for our friends, for our families. 
Let's celebrate Matt's life and cheers to Matt. I love you all. Thank you all. That's it. I keep expecting Matt to walk in on stage, <laughs> tell me to get out of the way. Um, thank you, Paul. Um, Rob, are you in the audience somewhere? And can I invite you up here? Here we go. Rob Crow, everyone. How are you guys? I'll make this short. Eventually. Uh, I'd often describe Matt Hoyt as the character in the sitcom where when the main characters were way late in some strange town, would go from door to door looking for the innkeeper, the sheriff, the veterinarian, or the judge or whatever, it all turned out to be the same person. He directed and wrote videos with me, book shows with me, book shows for me, unsolicitedly filmed my wedding. I wouldn't even have documentation of my wedding if Matt hadn't just shown up, taken it upon himself to just show up with a camera and start filming. <laughs> he ran the restaurant where my wife and I always went for date night when that was a thing we had time for. His dad was my lawyer. He even negotiated my family buying our first home. At Matt's bachelor party, which there was an organized roast, because that's the kind of self-depreciating humor that Matt and his many friends close to him enjoy. When it was my turn, I crumbled and basically said, fuck this, I like Matt, and I can't find it in myself to claim any different. <laughs> I sometimes have a problem with nuance. One of my favorite Matt stories was when he was getting the Soul Kitchen up to code. And if you don't know, the Soul Kitchen was a venue Matt ran back in the mid-90s or early 90s or fucking a million years ago. Anyway, the inspector came by to <laughs> unannounced, and the bathrooms were apparently unfinished and in a real state. And Matt just went, got a wet paint sign in, in front of the door, and the inspector was like, oh, let it be. Hoyt will be missed, but his, left, but his life left fucking, what the fuck am I? <laughs> I'm not used to wearing these, these glasses, man. It happens to all of us. Uh, Hoyt will be missed, but his life left fucking, what? His life kicked a fucking fair-sized dent in this town. And his sudden passing is awful, but I believe painful history, isn't learned from, it's a tragic waste, and I think basically it's like, do stuff, make stuff, quit smoking because you look like an asshole. Uh, bachelor party, I've referenced earlier, like I said, no, it's later, Matt, love, much love you guys. Thank you. Um, Rob, I love that, do stuff, make stuff. I'm gonna take that with me. Um, now, we have a space for any of you crazy people to come up here and share a memory of Matt. I'm gonna warn you that if you get out of control, I'm gonna let you go on. <laughs> uh, but um, I'm gonna pick a couple of you because we only have about 15 minutes so, raise your hand, big and strong, so I can pick a couple of you, fast and furious. I'm gonna let Jason go first, and then I'm gonna let you go, and then I'm gonna let you go. Okay, ready? Here we go. Hey, I have to accomplish four things. I'm gonna read Matt's screenplay. It's only gonna take 80 minutes or so. <laughs> we'll get that done. No, I'm going to read the last couple pages. But first, I have to make, I have to play something that everyone will love. And we're going to experience this together because I haven't read this screenplay in years. So it's all new to all of us. But first, a sound thing. Alright, 
two more. Coming in, number one on the top ten charts. These are just the things that weren't represented that had to be represented. And the screenplay took up so much of his life that I had to at least read part of it. The end part. We're going to figure out what the end is together, because I don't remember. <laughs> All right. So this is the last scene. Interior, 18-wheeler, semi, semi, semi? Semi cabin. <laughs> semi truck cabin. Don reaches, OK, we don't know what the story is. This is about The Amazing Dawn, a, uh, a play that he wrote in college, but this is the expanded version, Platinum Pine Cones. So that's the backstory. There's a kid that has narcolepsy named Danny, and the magician's name is Dawn. And, and, <laughs> and I'm just going to read the last couple pages. Okay. Dawn reaches into a bag of beef jerky. He tears off a piece and chews. He's wearing a hunting cap and a big down jacket. A surly truck driver, 46, climbs in as the engine idles. Sequoia and Danny walk by. Don watches while he chews his jerky. The dark pickup truck inches slowly behind them about 30 paces back. Don and the truck driver see this. From their height, they can see two baseball bats in the back. I think what happened, I don't remember what happened. Anyway. <laughs> Now, why would two guys in a pickup have two baseball bats? Looks like something's brewing. They ain't coaching Little League. Boys will be boys. You know those kids? No. Think we should stick around and make sure there's no funny business? The universe has a way of letting things unfold the way they should. Truck driver. Suppose you have a point there. Certainly don't need to get involved. Just be interesting to see who wins, Don. I don't think it matters who wins or loses. It's how you play the game. My sentiments exactly. Kids, man, you have a family, Felix? Sure. Barely see mine. Truth is, sometimes I think it's better that I'm on the road. Probably see more trouble if I stayed home. I hear that. You working right now, Felix? I'm on a leave of absence. From what? The IRS. Oh, man, the less I say to you on this drive, the better. I understand. I won't be offended. I was trapped in an office so long, thought I'd head out and see the country. Where are you headed again? I have no idea. Felix, you crack me up. Oh, before I forget, I got you a little something as a token of my appreciation for driving. Don pulls out a dream catcher from his jacket and hangs it on the rearview mirror. I love those things. The big rig pulls out of the casino parking lot. Don tears off another piece of jer beef jerky and looks out at the side view mirror at Sequoia and Danny walking. Exterior, casino parking lot, day. The truck stops in the middle of the parking lot blocking all passage. Lionel and Brad are back. They are hungover but drunk with anticipation. I don't know who those guys are. <laughs> Brad holds a baseball bat. Lionel has a baseball bat too, but his is smaller. I don't think we delivered message properly last time. Yeah, and, and Alfredo's not here either. Run. No way. Let me handle this. Like you did before? Yeah, they're going to kick my ass, probably for real this time. Are you out of your mind? I think so. Come on, let's go. No, get out of here. Danny unzips his jacket. He's ready for action. He feels something strange in his jacket pocket. It's a rubber chicken. It has writing on it. He looks at it. It reads, stay awake. Because Danny has narcolepsy, that's the whole point of this. <laughs> he turns it over. The other side says, don't go chicken on me, XO Don. The subtext is that the amazing Don might be this kid's father. It's never clear, but that might be what it is. Danny pauses for a moment. Just run, Sequoia. What? And watch you pass out again? I won't this time. How do you know? Run as fast as you can. Danny, this is ridiculous. I'm trying to save you here. Lionel and Brad slowly move towards Danny. Listen, all they want is to beat the shit out of me. And they will. I know, that's the idea. Sequoia runs toward the casino to get help. Danny stands weak and proud. He moves toward them with nothing to lose. Interior, ambulance. 
Danny awakes in an ambulance. He's covered in blood. His nose is unrecognizable. Both of his eyes are swollen. A bandage is wrapped around, tightly around his head to control the bleeding. A hand holds tightly to his arm. Danny, can you hear men? Can you hear men? Can you hear me? <laughs> Danny looks at Sequoia. There's a typo. How'd I do? Well, you didn't pass out. You're a mess, but you held your ground. Still think I'm a pussy? End credits. A sandwich board reads, open mic night tonight. That's it. Matt Hoyt. Jason doesn't like to take a lot of credit, but Jason was one of Matt's biggest art partners. This is all his work. A lot of his work. So thank you, Jason. All right. Who wants to be up next, wild and crazy? You have to introduce yourself, though. Uh, so please come forward. Yay. Hi. My name is uh, Chip Lancaster. I was the, I'm the father to Eric, who talked earlier. But I'm also the uh, self-designated and unofficial uh, father of Turkey Mallet. Not, not that I came up with that idea, but me and my beautiful wife Gloria back there, the mother, housed the band for eight years. And we only had the cops called on us once. But I have a quite unique uh, short uh, anecdote about Matt. So one day, uh, several years ago, I got a call from Matt. And it says, uh, Chip, I need a helicopter. <laughs> oh, OK. So I work at a helicopter museum, so I'm one of the pilots and docents there. And I said, OK, Matt, what do you, what do you need? And I tell this story every week at the, at the museum. And Matt says, well, uh, we're filming this movie, and uh, we just need a helicopter. And I said, well, Matt, I can't let you actually have one, but you can come here to the museum, which is Mona, California, and uh, see what we got. So the next weekend, Matt and uh, a couple of others, probably the producer, the cameraman and that, they came to the museum and they walked all around the museum. So we have 40 aircraft in the museum, 40 helicopters. And they finally settled on this one. And Matt said, we want that one. And I said, okay, well, you can't actually take it out of the museum, but you can come here and everybody can use it. And it was a, it's a helicopter called the Alouette 3. And they liked it because it was roomy enough to hold all of the actors. It had three seats in front and four in the back. Well, the next weekend, Matt and everybody else showed up in this strange uh, rope costume, which you can see if you watch uh, the, the movie Antarctic Huh. And, um, and they, all, they all fit inside. They surrounded it with green screen. And they spent the day there uh, filming their, uh, their movie. Anyway, I, I'm sort of, uh, I'm there watching, and the, the actor who's the pilot is going like, going like this with the controls. And I said, no, no, cut, cut. And I, I put in the word cut there, but I said, come on, you got to know how to fly a helicopter. So you put this hand here, and this hand, this hand goes down here, and then, then everybody has to do this. So I had them bouncing up and down. I've been looking at the, the clips over there to see if I actually see that. Anyway, that's my short anecdote about Matt. Uh, there's a thousand stories. Thank you so much. OK, we are definitely pushing time. But is there anyone else that wants to go? Otherwise, I'm going to call it for the night. OK, I love you guys so much. We are, one, one quick thing that I wanted to let you guys know that I'm gonna just say is a personal story is that Matt Hoyt was one of the best gift givers that I've ever known in the world. Uh, he loved to give great gifts. Um, so much so that he would plan for months in advance um, and really thought about what he could present to people that were both sweet and charming, also a little sometimes poke fun at you. My favorite one was when my now partner came to visit my family for the very first time, and Matt made a how to survive living with Melissa Bell package. <laughs> it included a 64 ounce flask, a bottle of whiskey, and a book called How to Stay Sane. <laughs> 
So thank you, Matt. It's worked. We're sort of sane. <laughs> Um, so I have a very small gift for all of you. It's very small, but uh, one of Matt's dear friends, Vaughn, printed out Starlight postcards. They're in the back. On your way out, please grab one of the postcards. I ask that you write something down on the postcards. We'll have pens out there too. You can write, write it today, you can write it tomorrow, you can write it whenever you want. But write something crazy that you want to do. Write something as crazy as opening an art gallery during the pandemic. I did not, like, I, like, oh, 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 here it goes. Yeah, I can, like, I cannot picture, <laughs> I cannot picture this. I, just, um. I think I just got called off stage. Everyone, please meet Melody. Hi. She has something to say. I have something to say. Like, I'll cry a lot. <laughs> Um, um, I'll be right here next yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, Matt. Uh, <laughs> here, I'll hold it. Please hold it, please hold it. Um, I don't know, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Melody is saying what we're all feeling. Yes, exactly, yeah. Oh, hello, hello, strangers. Um, or fr friends of this beautiful human. Okay, so I just want to say of this... I think for me, like, um, let's think about Matt in a way of, you know, he's always everywhere, everywhere, yeah. and yeah. always, like, is always, like, doing things and, like, just there, and now he can be there and chill and do that, and, yeah, and... This is the thing that I think is so beautiful. <laughs> okay, I'll tell them, sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, let me tell, can I tell what Matt did with you? Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> Melody is a crazy risk taker. And actually, we're joined now by Alicia, too. Who, as so many people have been impacted by Matt in this world, Matt said, you know what, Melody? You're, want, you want to open an art gallery in the middle of a fucking pandemic? Open a fucking art gallery in the middle of a fucking pandemic. <laughs> Alicia, who Matt was constantly driving him, her crazy as one of the original bartenders of Starlight, said to her, go fucking start a jewelry line in the middle of a goddamn pandemic. And what did she do? Start a jewelry line in the middle of a goddamn pandemic. So, this is what I'm saying. Go out and write on the postcard something crazy. If you don't have a big idea like opening an art gallery or, or starting a jewelry line, just write down, I'm gonna eat a Monte Cristo the next time I go to a restaurant. Go write down something that makes you feel excited. Write your address on that postcard and mail it to yourself. And then when you get it in the mail, have it be a reminder from Matt to go do something fucking wonderful and crazy with your life. Yes. Something amazing and beautiful Sorry. with your life. Because that's, yeah, that's yeah, what Matt no, would I want. Yes. Can I tell a funny story? Funny story. One. One. Just one. One. Because everyone wants to go to the bar. Okay. Uh, I, I, I know you guys want to go to the bar. Um, all right. One funny story. One crazy Matt story. Or, Here. No, or not. Okay. Or not. Yeah, I don't know. If you want I, to. Do you have a story? I, do, I know I did, but now I feel weird. <laughs> tell it. I know. Okay. Yeah, tell it. Okay. All right. All right. Starlight. Matt was, okay, not only, okay, yeah, okay. Matt was not only, like, he was, like, I met him before he was my boss. Like, he was my friend before he was my boss. And um, one of the times that we met was a very f fun, insane night. <laughs> I know, yes. <laughs> yeah. 
And uh, here we are. I know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I know. Yeah. Like if you gotta yeah. shut it down, you gotta shut I'm it down. I'm gonna. Well, I'm not gonna shut it down. I I'm gonna say this is this is Melody, and I want you all to first and foremost ask her about the crazy story that she has at the bar, and then go to Trash Lamb Gallery on Juniper Street and buy all of her shit because she is an amazing artist. Matt saw that in her. And this is what he sees in all of us, okay? So, without further ado, Melody, come here and hold my hand while we say this. I want everyone to raise a giant toast now, a giant toast later. Thank you for loving Matt. Thank you for being part of this community. Meet each other. Keep this bond going. We love you so much. Matt fucking Hurricane Hoyt. Yeah, baby! <laughs> yes! Yes! We love you so much. All right. We're here for another hour. Party your fucking heads off. If we leave tonight and you want to keep going, Whistle Stop, The Station, Mujeres, keep going for tonight and forever. We love you guys so much. Oh, my God. We love you so much. I, I know.